When I became a Christian, I had a, a wonderful childlike faith. I really believed if Jesus could walk through walls and raise from the dead, then this little gender issue was not going to be a problem for him, that he could turn it right around. I, I understood that by becoming a Christian, I was walking away from homosexuality. That was clear to me. There was never any question. It was both the way I had been evangelized, but it was also made a lot of sense to me. I looked at Genesis and how God made man and women and how he joined them together to become one flesh. All that scripture made a lot of sense to me. I completely ignore the scripture about homosexuality and I look at how God made the world and how God made male, female, and it just makes sense. I'm an engineer by trait. I look at good design and it's designed well. <laughs> how man and woman fit together. So there really was no, I had no intellectual argument there at all. It was very clear. I did have a problem with my heart because I really, really liked these relationships that I'd been in. I was really, I, I'd never been so happy. I'd never been so uh, safe, felt so safe. So I went to my coach shortly before I became a Christian. And I said, you know, I kind of want to become a Christian, but I think I like sin too much. And she smiled at me and she said, well, what do you think sin is? And I said, well, I guess it's whatever the Bible says is wrong. And she says, well, if God is a loving God and he cares deeply for you, then sin would be better defined as anything that hurts you. And this rudimentary definition of sin made a lot of sense to me at that point because I was hurting. You know, I could see this relationship dying and I was in pain and I thought, Okay, I'll swallow that. And that was, that was a pivotal moment in my, in my conversion process when, when, I heard, when I began to realize this is actually destructive to me. And I, I believed it fully. I credit the Holy Spirit with having a strong conviction throughout my whole Christian walk despite all my failures, despite all my frustrations. Never once did I think this is really okay with God. I was just going to go be a gay Christian. That was never part of my was never part of my temptation. I did think that perhaps I had been forsaken or that I was unhealable, uh, but but never did I think this is just going to be this is going to be okay with God. So I become a Christian, and I really think, boom, we're done, right? I just become a Christian. The lesbian thing goes away, and off we go. Imagine my surprise a year and a half later when I actually find myself in the arms of another Christian woman. I'm like, wait a minute, I don't think I'm supposed to be doing this. And, and it just sort of happened. And I think with lesbians especially, I think it's hard because there's so much help, uh, so much bonding that goes on in the sisterhood of believers that is healthy and good. And so you don't always know, you don't always catch that you're sort of sliding into a really gray area and then it's not gray anymore, it's just black. And, and, and that happened, especially the first time I was, I just sort of slid right in. I'm like, oh my. And I had no, I had no previous experience. I didn't really see it coming. But I took it quite seriously and, and I repented immediately and started going, getting healing prayer, going to counseling, going, okay, we got to figure out what's happening because I don't want to do that anymore. And then it happened again. And the second time was actually a little more dramatic. Unfortunately, I was working for our church office, and the person I fell with was also working for the church office. And so we were the two secretaries. We both get fired because of the fall, which of course created chaos in the church office, and you know, I, I single-handedly messed up the church. But also, that's when shame really started to come in. I thought, oh wow. I'm a really bad Christian. I really can't do this. I'm, I'm not very good at being a Christian. And unfortunately, where I think that was a point in my life where I could have turned into Jesus and said, okay, Jesus, I'm yours, take me. What I did was I said, I better fix this. And I tried very hard to fix myself. I did all sorts of counseling and prayer. I went through Living Waters, the Desert Streams Living Waters program. I learned a lot. I prayed earnestly. But I was really on a quest to heal myself. What I didn't realize was that I needed Jesus to put me back together again. That I needed Jesus to tell me who I really was. That I needed Jesus to break down all the lies and all the vows and all the twists and all the turns that I had taken to construct this, this self that wasn't the woman he created. And I didn't realize that it was going to take dying to me and to what I understood to be myself and letting Jesus 
raise me from the dead. So what this looked like on the outside was I would, I would struggle through, I would get involved in Christian friendships that would turn. I got involved in several more of those, always repenting, always feeling terrible, always wondering if I was truly saved, wondering if God could put me back together. At the same time, though, if I'm perfectly honest, I had, I had my foot in the pool of, of the gay world. There was part of me that said, that was still getting fed. I had a job in which I had high exposure to a lesbian community and they were actively recruiting me and they were flirting with me and they were, you know, affirming my cuteness and, and that felt good. And so I, I, was, I was entertaining that on the side. And if I'm absolutely obvi- honest, I have to go back and say, yes, I entertained that. And if I'm, and if I'm perfectly honest, I have to say, I didn't, I didn't give Jesus all of me. I, I held that iron in the fire. And that actually, sadly, went on for eight years. And, and then in the eighth year, I fell again, and I thought, you know, this is just dumb. I don't want this anymore. I am not doing this anymore. I cannot, I am finished. And I didn't know quite what that meant. I was just like, I'm done. And I, on the one hand, I thought about taking my life because I'm like, if I'm not ever going to get free, here I am, not only am I just sort of broken, but I'm hurting other people. I'm bringing people down. And, and I could just, I was, I was hopeless and frustrated. And so I drove my car out to the beach. I was sort of thinking I would drive it off a cliff or something. And, and I got to the beach in the middle of the night and I just sat there and I said, God, what, what, what? I'm listening. What do you want from me? So I'm sitting at the beach in my car, and I'm thinking, you know, what, what should I do? And I was sitting there, not, you know, sort of yelling at God, going, why aren't you healing me? What's going on? And I remembered uh, a couple that I had met a long time ago. Who, they were a Christian couple, Bill and Sally, and they had helped some friends of mine. And I felt this sense in my spirit that I should just call them. And, and I thought, really? I mean, they don't even know the lingo. They're not, you know, tied into the healing community. And I just felt like, give them, give them a call, you know. So I did that. I went back home the next day. I called Sally. And I, I said, can I come and chat with you for a little bit? And I went to her house and I said, you know, I'm, I'm done with this Christian thing. I can't do this. I know that Jesus died for my sins. I know that he rose from the dead. I want to follow him. And yet I keep falling into sin and I can't stop. And so Sally said, come on and move in. What she meant was move into my garage and, and we'll just see what God does. And two days later, Sally called me on the phone and she said, you know, Christy, uh, I've been praying for you and I feel like God has a new middle name for you. And the new middle name is Victorious. And I thought to myself, you have no idea. <laughs> how unlikely it is that that's my new middle name. I was, I was just, I, I, I just had no faith for that whatsoever. But I said, that's nice. Thanks very much. But two other things happened at that time. I, I moved in with Bill and Sally in their garage. I quit my job uh, and, and said, you know, this is not an environment that's helpful to me. And I took a job as a teacher. I taught uh, high school math at a private school. And then I also... Uh, left my church for a year and went to a different church. And the reason I needed to do that was because of that shame cloak. I, was, I would go to church every day. It was almost like I'd get out of the car and put on my shame cloak and walk in. I am the one who's fallen. I am the one who's pathetic. I am the one who can't walk with Jesus. And I couldn't, in my own power, take that cloak off. And so I stopped going to that church, and I went to a church where I wasn't known as the fallen one. Little did I know that they weren't looking at me as the fallen one at the church, right? I mean, the, the, my faithful friends at, at my church, they saw what God could do. They could see that I was flirting with darkness. They could see that God wanted me whole, and they never lost faith in me. Uh, but I, I couldn't do it. It was, it was my problem, not the church's. But those three things really created an environment for me, moving in with, with Bill and Sally, quitting my job and getting a new job as a teacher and, and leaving my church for a short period of time, created an environment in which I could lie down 
at the feet of Jesus and say, I'm yours. And oh, how I wish I had done that earlier. You know, I was so afraid of the pain. I was afraid of letting go of what I knew for something that I didn't know. Sometimes I think of it as being a trapeze artist, you know, who swings out to grab the, the trapeze, but you have to let go of the old trapeze first. And I just didn't have the courage to let go of the old trapeze for the free fall that it takes to get to the new one. I was terrified of that. You have to remember that I was, I was born rejecting my femininity. And so I had no idea really what it meant to be a woman. And I, I was scared of it. And one of those things that happened in the early eight years was that I was at a conference and they were praying over the group of us. And they said, you know, we want you to imagine your, gar your heart as a garden and let God show you where the weeds are that he wants to pull out and where the beauty is that he wants to accentuate. And I, and I sat and I closed my eyes and all I saw was dirt. And there was nothing there but dirt. And that so terrified me that I really, I really didn't have the courage to let God have that dirt and show me what was there. I was like, okay, we're just gonna go back to, well, you know, this is just too hard. So finally, after eight years, I move in with Bill and Sally, and, and I start to walk in, in, in what Jesus has for me. I came across a picture at this time of a sheep, uh, Jesus holding a sheep over his shoulders, surrounded by a flock. And I, and I felt like that was a picture for me. That was the position that I was to hold, was as that lamb across the shoulders of Jesus being carried, that it was no longer me who's walking, it's the lamb being carried. Every day, I would wake up in the morning, I'd go into Bill and Sally's house for breakfast, and Sally would say, good morning, Christy Victorious. And every night, I'd come over work and she'd say, hi, Christy Victorious, how was your day? And that woman called me Christy Victorious for 18 straight months, and it, and it went in. You know, it was time, my heart was ready, and I became Christy Victorious. I became the woman that, that God had for me in that time. Sally's pers persevering, prayerful love of me, uh, learning how to be quiet before the Lord. I had a lot of alone time in there. You realize I had stopped going to my church, so I was a little bit isolated but in a good way, because Sally was right there. And, and she taught me to sit still. I built a three-foot cross. I still have it on my wall that um, I learned to look into and let Jesus just minister to my spirit. And I brought my pain there, and I discovered that if I tell Jesus my pain, Jesus can handle it and take it. And it doesn't come back to me and, and, and overwhelm me. Jesus can actually hold that pain. And Jesus can actually fill the wounds and heal the wounds where that pain is coming from. I discovered forgiveness. Jesus didn't look at me as the fallen one. Jesus looked at me as Christy Victorious. He saw me as this, as this daughter of his, and he wanted me to know that. But if I didn't sit still long enough and read scripture enough and let him minister to my spirit, I was never going to hear it. So in that time, I just really... Jesus really started speaking into me. It was a wonderful, wonderful time of me becoming who I am and discovering who I am. He went in and, and, and reparented me in many ways. This failure to bond with my mom is, is, a, is a problem that only Jesus can solve. I can't go get another mom as a 22-year-old and say, be my mommy. Uh, there's no, that's not appropriate. But Jesus can do that. Jesus can go in and, and go back in time and minister to that child and say, I'm going to cover this, and I'm going to, I'm going to develop you, and I'm going to, I'm going to heal and, and nurture you in the way you need to be nurtured. And he did. He really did do that. So in, that, in those years, I had a wonderful experience. I also discovered in teaching that I had a soft side. And now, if that soft side had come up any earlier, I probably would have said, you mm, know, we can't be soft. But it, as, as I taught seventh and eighth graders who were just sort of in that awkward place of their own, I loved them, and I cared for them, and I nurtured them in a, in a really good, healthy way. I thought, oh, I didn't know that was in me. You know, I didn't, I didn't know I could be soft and nurturing in that way. And so there was a great freedom coming there. I spent one year away from the church, and then I went back. I, I should say, I spent one year going to a different church, 
And that church had been tremendously affirming to me. And, and I think that God probably had his hand on that process because there was something about the men and women in that church that they really loved on me well for the one year I was with them. And they really sort of invited me in as a fellow sister. And that, that was a tremendously uh, affirming experience for me. One of the real challenges for me in the Christian world was because I had cut myself off from my femininity, I didn't really know how to relate to women, heterosexual women, whole women, and I felt very insecure in that environment. I thought, you know, these are, these are people who are comfortable wearing lipstick, and these are people who can wear skirts, and I don't get it. I, you know, it was just all very scary to me. And so I had trouble identifying with them and identifying myself with them. And I, I so thank God for the church that I went to because they were not afraid of that. It was almost as if in this church there was a sense of we are going to help you walk this out. And they knew that I couldn't go to them, and so they came to me. And they said, hey, I love you. And I'd have these really super feminine women come up to me, Christy, I love you, and let's go do this. Let's go hang out together. I'm like, you want to hang out with me? Do you realize that I'm not one of you? And, and they were like, I, I don't see that. I, I don't see that you're not one of us. I see that, that you're a woman and we can go hang out. And that was so tremendously affirming to me. And, and I cannot overstate the impact of having healthy heterosexual women choose me for a friend and, and how much that fed into my sense of my own femininity. Like, oh, I'm not some kind of garbage on the bottom of the trash can. I'm not, I'm not someone who is so, so different from these people. Um, and, and they essentially taught me without teaching me, they taught me how to walk in my femininity, uh, how, to, how to be a girl. They would do things that I thought, you know, you know, previously I would think, gosh, that's a girly, girly thing to do. And then I'm like, actually, they just want to do it. They're getting their nails painted because they want to, not because they're girly girls. And it, so there was a whole sort of uh, paradigm shift for me in discovering that heterosexual women were not all that different from me. And, and I, could, I could be a friend and loved by them. And that spoke volumes into my identity as a woman. When I first connected with the man that was later to become my husband, we were actually touring in, in another country with some common friends. And he, I, he was standing next to me and so they were taking our picture and I put my hand on his shoulder. And I thought to myself, now this is a man I could get behind. And I was shocked by this feeling. First of all, I had way old feminist buttons going, get behind, what are you thinking? But at the same time, I was thinking, wow, like I want to partner with a man? And, and it's interesting when I, when, I, when I realized it was the same fingers on the shoulder experience, 20 years later, uh, I have this hand on the shoulder and I'm thinking to myself, I have something to offer this man. I love the way he sees the world. I love his vision for the planet and what life is with God. And I want to partner with him in this. And it was altogether different from this feeling of watching my soul go into someone else. It was, in fact, it was kind of a polar opposite. It was more like, I'm solid, he is solid. Together we could make a bigger solid. And, and I, want to, I want to help him be who he is. And, and of course, he helps me be who I am. And so I ended up marrying him after a, a somewhat long courtship. But uh, it, it is so fundamentally different the way he and I relate compared to what it was to be meshed in with, with women. Um, there's, a, there's a solid wall there. Uh, as someone had once said, it's skin to skin, but there is skin. You know, and there is a sense of of solidness. He, he calls me into more of who I am. I call him into more of who he is. And we have a, a solid partnership. We parent two, uh, two children, and it's, and it's a fantastic experience. I also had to come to a realization, and this was much, much later, that, um, that because I had started at such an early age in hiding from pain through women, through these relationships, that remains to this day to be how I uh, would self-medicate. 
It doesn't look the same now, but there are times when I feel a crisis or extreme stress, and I feel like all of a sudden I want to call someone who really, I only want to call them because I know they like me. Or I only want to press into a relationship with them because it makes me feel good. And that's sort of what I would call the remnants of my old self-medicating pattern. And I no longer, I don't look at that and say, oh no, now I'm not healed, which is what I used to do. Now I look at it and go, huh, what's going on in my heart that I'm afraid? What's stressing me out? What is it that's, that's got me off kilter? And then I take that and I, and I go to someone who I do trust, who is good for me. And I say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm seeing myself sort of wanting to bend. And I think that's, I think there's something going on in my heart and I can't quite figure it out. Can you help me figure out what it is? And I take, take that issue to, to God and to healthy people, and I stare at my three-foot cross, and I, and I let Jesus have it. Um, and that's what, that's what I would say is the, is the remnant of my old ways of, of living. If I were to uh, speak to someone who's in the lifestyle now, my heart really is, there's so much more. There's so much more that God has for us than than same-sex relating. It's just not the full life that God has. And God can transform anyone and do anything uh, to bring us to the wholeness of who he has us to be. I also have a heart for, um, for women in the church who are struggling and who are bearing the shame of that struggle. And, and I think if I were to meet someone, and I do meet people who, who bear the shame of that struggle, I would say, there is nothing that God can't do. Turn to him in it. Don't turn away. Don't say, oh, this is my struggle over here. Turn to Jesus, and Jesus will carry it. Jesus will take it, but, but we need to let him have it. We can't sort of try to fix it up and present ourselves to him done because that's not the way it's going to be. I actually look back at this struggle now, and I'm somewhat thankful for it because it has taught me how to press into Jesus with pain and with things that I'm scared of and with things that are maybe sinful in my heart, instead of, instead of that posturing of trying to fix it on my own. Um, and, and, and I do have an intimacy with Jesus that comes from years of having to lay it down at him, laying my fears before him, my pain before him, at myself before him, and letting him change me. The church has an, an absolutely essential role in the healing process for, for people coming out of same-sex relationship. Our tendency, I think, as a church is to, is to pull away and to go, ugh, scary. But, but it's exactly the opposite of what the struggler needs. What the struggler needs is for solid men and women to come around them and say, hey, we don't see you as gay. We don't see you as, as you know, this dark thing. We see you as a son or a daughter of the Most High God who, who is in a process, and we want to help you with that process, and we love you in that process, and we care for you in that process, just as we are in a process. Everyone has to lie down before the cross and die. Everyone has to. And the same-sex struggler has a unique opportunity to lie down before the cross and die because they, in some ways, are, are letting go of a whole identity that's a little more black and white than the guy who struggles with maybe spending too much money or watching too much TV. You know, we as same-sex struggler strugglers have a, a wonderful opportunity to say, okay, God, I'm yours. And, and the church has a unique opportunity to help them to do that, to walk alongside them, because it's terrifying. And it's terrifying to walk into a church full of, of women who have it all together and know that there's something wrong with your femininity. And I think the onus is on the church to reach out. Don't make them come to you, right? That's not fair. If the church can reach out and lift up and say, hey, we're on either side of you walking you forward, uh, I think that that could change the world. <laughs>